one would expect to find as the season approaches. Some of the traders attributed the slowdown in activities mainly to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on importation of goods and also due to a focus on the general election in December. They are, however, hopeful that the situation may improve in the weeks to come. The sale of toys and other items for children, which would normally be recording high sales, has taken a turn this year. Yabo has sold these items for the past 15 years. When I started from June, when we say yes, I 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 the partial restriction on some forms of social gatherings has affected Mr. Bediaku, who deals in disposables for events. Uh, this year's Christmas, we are just monitoring um, the COVID situation because uh, what we're dealing with, we're dealing with disposables and the mail is for social functions. And now we want to find out whether it, is, it will be open for people to gather more or something. So we are just more time for now. What I can say is that most of our partners in China, for instance, because of the COVID, you know, uh, the production from the factory, they are not no more, they are not very active. So sometimes getting their stuff is very difficult. Because I have to take time and even the import, is, is, is just, yeah, it, doesn't, it takes time. So all depends on the COVID. The COVID has brought all these things because most of our partners, you know, they don't go to where some of them, you know, their lives have changed. They've lost some of our partners. So it will take some time. Maybe we are waiting for the end of the year. By next year, things will pick up. Yeah. Mr. Borti, who has been in business for over 35 years, says he has had to increase prices of all his goods since duties paid on imports have increased. Yes, um, some of the products that we get from Nigeria, like the savlons and the detours and all those things, yes, they are not coming in as much as they, they were. They were coming in before because of the, the borders has been closed. So those things, the prices have shot up very, very high. But apart from the things coming from the port, that one, there's no problem. Okay, so there's not been any price changes? There have been huge price changes because the goods are not coming. The few that are in the system, the prices have been increased. Nonetheless, he's hopeful business will pick up for him to cash in during Christmas. We usually, during the holidays, we give some small, small discounts to our customers. Because that's why we do to entice them to come and buy from here. Well, we will, but it will not be as high. If it was 5% now, it will be 2% since um, the system is it's a little high, so we cannot give the 5% that we used to give. But we we'll do something so that we can be competitive. The sale of footwear, however, appears to have picked up slightly for some sellers. Isaac Amponsa says business is as normal as it could be around this time. We wish our market women well, but we wish ourselves well too. After all, we're the ones who go and buy from them anyway. But still on the Christmas festivities. Now, this is a period when there's so much to buy on the market. You even find products that are not readily available all year round. Now, some of them even come in some interesting languages. And you even find others also that are near expiry being sold at reduced prices. I'm really wondering what the Food and Drugs Authority will be doing about that particular situation this time round. The Christmas season usually comes with many business deals, some of which may appear too good to be true. From discounts to promotions, many traders will do anything to beat competition and increase profits. But going into the season, the emergence of many unusual products on the market is widespread, with unscrupulous sellers swindling unsuspecting shoppers through ridiculous deals. A lot of traders join the masses to sell products which are either expired or unapproved. These unwholesome some products are often hoarded and released onto the market during the festive period. A few are also imported with no proper checks through the country's entry points. In order to fast track the sale of such products, they are usually displayed with really low prices. Most unsuspecting buyers unfortunately consume these unwholesome products and end up with severe health problems. The Food and Drugs Authority FDA, which is responsible for the regulation of all foods, food supplements and others, in anticipation 
duration of the threat around that time of the year has pledged to intensify its presence and surveillance activities at the ports and markets to prevent the influx of such goods. The head of the Food Industrial Support Services Department at the FDA, Ebenezer Kofiesel, in an interview with City Business News, outlined how the authority plans to undertake this. During the same time that these purchases are going up, we also have a situation where um, some unscrupulous business people will take advantage of the situation and want to exploit um, unsuspecting consumers. And so there are a lot of activities that we carry out. We become more vigilant or not that, uh, this, I mean, you know, we say become more vigilant, not in terms of the scope of work that you do, but you bring in more officers, you throw in more officers to the front, either at the port or in trade, you put them out there to carry out uh, what we call the market surveillance. And so you have your controls intensified at the ports. You also have your presence felt more at the, uh, in the markets or in the markets, trying to check what is on sale, what people are offering for sale, and then taking appropriate steps to ensure that the products are safe for consumption, they are registered products. And most importantly, what do you also do to intensify your public education? The FDA is, however, asking consumers to be vigilant in their purchases, particularly before and during the Christmas period. For instance, in the years past, we realized there was a trend where most of the people were buying um, old rice bags, some of, the, some of the rice dealers. They would buy old rice bags and pour out uh, old stocks of rice into these bags to make them look fairly new, resew it or stitch it up, and then offer it for sale at a very cheap price. We are not saying that people will not reduce prices of goods to sell during these times. But you should also be very careful that when you see the prices of certain commodities reduced drastically low, then you should be very suspicious of what you are buying. The other thing too is that if you go ahead to do the purchases, make sure that you are able to read what is on the, doc on the, on the packages. Wearing kente for a traditional marriage was originally my wife's idea. I wasn't even sure how to wrap the fabric, but when I first saw the cloth, I was sold. It was beautiful with intricate designs and the many colors. You should have seen us on that day. We look like royalty. Like I mean, na 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 na. The pictures were one of my all-time favorites. Now I am a kente enthusiast and I'm really looking forward to the Kente Museum in Bunre when it is finally completed. I'll be visiting there and you should come along too. Kente weavers at Bunre and other areas in the Ashanti region often go through a lot of difficulty in getting raw materials to produce the local fabric. The challenge for individuals in the industry continues to be the availability of the yarns used for production. Addressing the chiefs and people of the area, Vice President Dr. Mahamudu Baumia said the Kente Museum would be constructed alongside a yarn factory. First time in history, Yebeye Kente Museum was born with But said the Nanaka, you know, Yempese Yeye Week, Ke, Ke, Ke. Ushua, this is Yeye Yarn Factory, no, Empka. Museum, no, so because a page bon Reacting to this, the chief of Bonure, Nanabobie Ansa II, said the establishment of a yarn factory will be a massive boost for the weavers. Yes, yes, sir. Yarn factory, maybe I'm a penny and a sassy in Yakintahuman Waganaha near Cream Flaman or near. A babua a makente buono abafom na makente industry nusu apejapa. The Minister for Tourism, Arts and Culture, Barbara Otinjesi, added that the establishment of the museum forms part of an effort to protect the kente cloth. Say a jume die say a ye akwansra e jumano a ye tourism, arts and culture. E betum poa na e jina ya mamre ni ya manye so. If we say a no na ya dear strong kwa amanonifuny na episode mutu kwain no mobe she na ye nya nim se ken te de ye yini free mwa e ye ye da andunti boy re mai yakuma eda muso ya kente weavers association yakuma eda muso 
Ye can tell no, I say a bohu buying. If you say at the gunner mine, eh, do a church, 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 the Kente Museum is expected to enhance income for weavers through tourism and exposure. I think you've had a rough year. Now, imagine starting a restaurant at a time when people are being told to stay at home, observe social distancing, and not gather around, and I'm being told not to do all the things you originally would have come to do at your establishment. Now, still with that, imagine again also that your landlord is demanding rent at a time where you are trying to figure out how to pay your staff even when no money is coming in. Now, this was the reality of a number of entrepreneurs, but yet still, they managed to stay afloat. Na Oyokomoji is a food blogger who launched her restaurant, Essie's, after the lifting of the partial lockdown. Fortunately, Na was not perturbed by the pandemic. She used the difficult times as an opportunity to better serve her customers. So one of our strategies was, you know, increasing the use of um, social media and other digital tools. I mean, it's not like we weren't already using them, but now it's like you have to um, really, you know, go all out and use, you're using WhatsApp, you're using um, Google Forms, you're using Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Everywhere. Despite her resilience, Naoyo has not been spared from the increased cost of doing business that has come with complying by the coronavirus protocols. You know, you are already paying so much for your electricity bill, you know, um, you have your staff that you have to pay, etc. And then you have ingredients, etc. Like every day I buy. Lexi Boaheng is the founder of Cafe Accra. She opened her restaurant a few weeks before the pandemic and has been operating since. Although her business is doing relatively well, she has also not been spared from the financial burdens of the pandemic. Buying sanitizer and buying masks. Like, who would have ever thought that before someone walks in, they have to use a gel to rub their hand. Like, and that's an extra cost that we didn't budget for in our business plan initially. Um, you know, making sure everyone wears masks. That's an extra cost that we didn't think. Like, we, who would have, like, honestly, who would have ever thought that would have to take out chairs and tables just so that we can, you know, provide some social distancing. Like, we can't even make use of this gorgeous <laughs> ensemble because of the space. In spite of these challenges, Lexi is hopeful that the hospitality industry will see better days. So I'm definitely confident that we will have a buzz like we did last year. Whether it's as much, that's the questionable side. Um, but I do believe we'll have a lot of visitors this year. I mean, we've changed our new, uh, we've changed our menu. We have a new menu in preparation for them, just giving them a bit more variety and adding a vegan, uh, vegan um, menu to it as well. So you know, if you're if you're vegan, we have a vegan option that that's you know that can satisfy your need because we know a lot of people that are visiting have different you know um, expectations. Some entrepreneurs have found innovative ways of helping these eateries succeed. Kinsley Abrakwa is the founder of Kudigo. He shares the value his company brought entrepreneurs. For people in the food services business, restaurants, bars and pubs, what we did for them is we first of all ensure that they are able to offer delivery to customers without having to get their own delivery resources. So as of today, we have over a hundred buy companies working with us such that a typical restaurant you go to, instead of going there, you can just order online from the storefront and they'll deliver to you. We also went further to create a WhatsApp shop for them. We have some restaurants who, once you chat their WhatsApp number, it will instantly let you order without interacting with a human being. And the whole idea is to help them manage the inflow of traffic from all these customers, at the same time, ensuring that people don't have to come to the restaurant to be able to buy food from them. Seth Chum Akwabwa, the CEO of the Association of Ghanaian Industries believes that while the achievements of these entrepreneurs are commendable, they will need specialized support from the government. 
I think by Christmas, our uh, business would, would come up because the easing of the restrictions and all that, gradually business is picking up. So they have to prepare. And one way to help them prepare, because they lost some of their staff, they have to meet this, they have to reorganize, they have to recruit new staff. How can we assist them to train new staff so that they get ready for uh, further business? So that is how these businesses were able to stay afloat in the midst of the pandemic. Running a business is hard, but running a business in a flood-prone area like Adabraka is even harder. You can imagine having to lose your wares every now and then to floods and water destroying your product. As you can see in our shot behind over there, those are some deep freezers that were affected by the floods and they are being dried out. I'm sure you're wondering what it entails operating in a flat prone area. This video brings you up close to it. On Friday night, millions of Ghanaians slept through the night as they enjoyed the beautiful rain and cold breeze that accompanied it. Unfortunately, for some entrepreneurs at Adabraka, the rain represented an unavoidable threat to their businesses. City Business News spent some time with these business owners after the water had subsided. They recount their experiences as they clean up what was left of their ventures. Samuel Otabel is a barber who lost two full days of work and expensive machinery to the floods. Obri Felix is the owner of a motor parts company. He was quick enough to pack his goods before he saw the flats making their way to him. But that still did not stop the rain from flowing into his shop and destroying his properties. The executive director of Bureau of Public Safety, Nanaya Akwada, warns that should entrepreneurs who pay the price for these floods lose their economic livelihoods, the potential threat they will pose to the nation could be dire. In terms of public safety, the cost is dire. It's dire because look at the class of people that these floods are throwing out of business. These are people between the ages, what we call the economic um, age bracket, between 25 and 45. So once these people do not have jobs, there are those who resort to other forms of social vices to make a living. That has a translation into the general public safety City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Telling Ghana's business stories, 
City TV brings you a dedicated business news bulletin that showcases the business temperature of the country in one go. The business dashboard, the markets, industry, and policies that affect the way we do business. All covered in one bulletin. The business dashboard, 7 p.m. every weeknight on City TV. Remember last week when we brought you a story about the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority workers and their concerns over encroachment on their company lands? Well, there's been some updates this week. Um, let's find out if management and government paid heed to their concerns. Workers of the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority began their strike today to draw the attention of the Ministry of Aviation, the Lands Commission and the Presidency to some concerns they currently have. For years, the workers have lamented the continuous encroachment of private developers on lands reserved for operations of the GCAA. In a press conference held last week to drum home their issues, the workers blamed the Ministry of Land and Natural Resources for taking no action while lands belonging to the authority were sold out to private developers. They added that the strike had become necessary after exhausting all relevant avenues including meetings and discussions with the executive management of GCAA and the Ministry of Aviation. Spokesperson for the Workers' Union, William Amwako, tells City Business News this action is a partial one which will only affect domestic flights until their concerns are duly addressed. Yeah, so this means that... Uh Staff are not working, um, other staff are not working. When it comes to the serious effect of it, the air traffic services, they are going to, we call it minimum service or partial service. Um, we're going to withdraw services for specific uh, airlines, especially for now, we are doing it for the domestic airlines. Um, we are very conscious of the impact that this thing has I mean, with the international community. So for now, we are not touching international flights. So we want to do domestic flights and see if we can put some level of pressure on the government to intervene and solve this problem once and for all. In an interview with City Business News, Eric Mirikua Mening, manager of corporate communications at GCAA, said management, together with the Ministry of Aviation, had stopped ongoing work on a portion of land at La TS until there were further deliberations on the matter. So um, yesterday, the Minister for Aviation, Honorable Kofi Ada, I mean, uh, met with um, the La Traditional Council. Um, Lands Commission and um, Civil Aviation at a meeting at the lab transmitters um, where the site is and it was agreed but I mean and the parties involved I mean should suspend all works till amicable I mean solution is fine to is found to the matter so as I speak to you um, there's been an agreement I mean with all the parties but I mean development and um, all activities in the land I mean, should cease. However, the workers say the strike action will continue until all activities on the lands are immediately stopped and land titles are issued in the name of GCAA. They other that the extension of the strike action will affect international flights. If it escalates, then of course there's a possibility of uh, roping in the international flights. This has been the trend. Anytime there's a threat, you have them coming in to plea. But you see, the problem is once we stand down, then it goes back to normal and activities are on this size resume even in twofold, threefold. And uh, we are, many, we are I mean, facing the brunt of it and we know the effects of uh, communication failures, surveillance failures, and navigation failures. Good. Yeah, so this time we are saying that we are not uh, accepting any promises or just verbal promises. So we want something concrete on the ground. Barely 24 hours after, the strike was called off. Workers of the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority met with the Chief of Staff, 
to make room for more deliberations over the alleged encroachment of lands earmarked for the authorities' operations. Spokesperson for the workers, William Amwako, told City Business News activities on one of the lands has been halted. We met with the chief of staff and we put forward our grievances. Uh, she had a listening ear and she has promises that she's going to do everything possible to ensure that all the grievances has been addressed. Uh, number one on it was that um, we want all activities on the lands to cease because it is these activities that are affecting our communication and uh, I mean all other related systems in delegation. When these are activities have stopped, then they are going to set up a technical committee to evaluate the whole thing and uh, see how best to protect our equipment and do any other technical evaluations and uh, where, for instance, uh, our staff are also being affected, they also have to look into it and see how best to, if there's the need to resettle them, they will resettle them. Friday was World Food Day and I know for all the foodies out there like my producer Jifa, it really makes you smile thinking about some good food like some fufu with some uh, ponche crackra and some light soup, some ginger on the side and well for the rice pans I'm sure uh, some rich jollof over there, some grilled chicken, kili willy and yeah some sobolo to wash it down. Now, after several years of us having this our local foods, it's quite saddening that we haven't done much to process, package them, to talk less of exporting. But well, there are some entrepreneurs who are making some strides in that area. Let's check them out. In the last decade, advocacy for healthy meals has made way for a healthy food industry that is projected to grow to $81.82 billion by 2021. At the base of these healthy snacks are peanuts, cashew, chocolate, and dried fruits. Companies such as General Mills have grown into multi-billion dollar multinationals through adding value to peanuts, chocolate, dried fruits, and turning them into snacks. Ghana has these fruits and nuts in abundance. Unfortunately, her positioning on the global value chain as an exporter of primary products has historically inhibited her from making significant returns from the billion dollar healthy foods industry. But one entrepreneur is determined to change this. Bentel Opok moved back to Ghana to help local farmers turn primary goods such as granuts and cashew nuts into healthy snacks. I realized that most of the ingredients that we are using there are ingredients that are very common to this part of the world. And also, you know, growing up in Ghana, um, was used to snacking on products like kati cake and kube cake. And these are products that have been reformulated in, from where I was out there. They've added value to it, packaged it in a way that is presentable. And it is adding, like you know, graciously to their economy. And uh, having realized that, I saw a gap between what we do here and what is done over there. And I realized that maybe I can take that technology and bring it here. We decided that, you know, why don't we come to Ghana and add value within the agricultural um, supply chain, right from the farmer onto the table. In 2009, agriculture contributed an impressive 30.99% to the nation's GDP, but that number sadly dropped to 17.31% last year, 1.59% to 29.27%. A major factor in the decline of the agricultural sector is the participation of smallholder farmers operating in silos instead of a cooperative with a ready market. Barbara Mante, the founder of Kitchen Hut Foods, works with farmers in the palm nut industry to turn raw produce into finished goods with longer shelf life. We process um, local foods and one of our products is Easy Palm Nut. Easy Palm Nut is 
process in the way that you get it in the local taste that palm nut is supposed to be but without the hustle without the trouble of pounding and sieving and doing all of that we process in an easy way with zero preservatives so you get all the nutritional value of this food imports alone in Ghana um, has cost us about two billion every year and it's increasing and, and, and food products like um, rice, oil, sorghum, wheat are all brought into the country when we can do this by ourselves all year and we grow our own food but that's not the case because um, other sectors have had funding directly from government but it's not really the case for agriculture. Dr. Alex Amparabing, a fiscal policy specialist at Oxfam, explains why it is crucial for government to help these entrepreneurs scale up their ventures to help the economy grow. Not long ago, CTTV was campaigning for Made in Ghana Rice. Excellent initiative. But at the same time, did you know rice importers were enjoying that 50% reduction at the port? So this is counterproductive. Here we are, you want to do planting for food and jobs. Excellent. We are producing the rice, we are producing the material. But then the doors are open and people are enjoying 40%, uh, 50% for the rice. So where are we? So we need one government to support with guaranteed funding. Number two, to put in measures to protect local enterprises. And from us as individuals, it's time for us to start changing our mindset and support Made in Ghana. Combing your natural hair, even for us guys, when your hair is a bit grown, can be very painful. So, so I wonder how ladies who have this much hair are able to cope with it. And I was very surprised also to realize that natural hair has actually become a thing. So those are some very brave ladies. So, you know, I was surprised one time when I saw a lady with natural hair combing her hair and it didn't seem to hurt. Clearly, the natural hair industry has gone through a lot of transformation this past decade. For years now, Ghanaian salons have cashed in from clients who opt for styles to hide or alter their natural looking hair. That trend, however, has considerably slowed down. While black women continue to spend considerable amounts of money on their hair, there has been a significant shift in products, categories and styles. A number of people have been able to create meaningful businesses to cater to this growing trend, such as natural hair bloggers who share tips on how to maintain natural hair, individuals who make natural hair products, as well as individuals who have established natural hair salons. Subsequently, investments from beauty industry giants have helped these natural hair products move from speciality stores to shelves of major retailers in the country. According to London-based research firm Mintel, black spending on relaxers fell by 30.8% between 2011 and 2016. By the end of 2020, it is estimated that relaxers will plummet to the smallest segment of the hair care market. When Kuoko Aisa returned to the country some 10 years ago, she could not find a salon that could help her take care of her natural hair. There were places like kiosks and containers that I could go in to do my hair, but they didn't really have much knowledge about how to keep healthy natural hair. They also oftentimes were not the best in terms of having a clean environment, making sure that everything that was needed was available. Today, she is the owner of one of the biggest natural hair salons in the country, Twist and Locks Natural Hair Salon. I didn't begin the business thinking of it as a multi-CD business. It was more of there was a need. I decided I would invest some time and energy into it, and the goal was to just set it up and see what would happen. So I was pleasantly surprised because um, in the very first year, so I count the first year from 2010, in the very first year we had a lot of people coming in. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm talking about 10, 15, 20 maximum. A good, yeah, in a week, and that was one location. A good weekend would have maybe um, more than 10 people. We would be excited. We have two locations, East Legon and Osu, and between the two we have about 120 clients a week. So it's, it's growing, it's grown, and it's definitely 
lockdown affected us, but then since then we've certainly been increasing again, which is great. For Roland Kuming, who has been a professional hairstylist for the past five years, the risk he took three years ago to focus on natural hair has definitely paid off. No, it wasn't on natural. It was like uh, all kinds of hair, like those permed weave-ons and, you know, braids and everything, yeah. But later I switched to natural and dreadlocks, yeah. Because I wanted to be known for something special. You know, I thought that was my specialty, so I wanted people to know me that that's what I do. It wasn't easy. It was a risk that I took. Uh, along the line, you know, I, I realize most of Ghanaians are actually into natural. Singer and actress Aduma Ajimain is one of the many women who have come to love their natural hair. Brand new hair, brand new me. Me penis out. Me soul in it can know. At that time, I felt like if I was going to write a song, people should be able to hear the song and know a little more about natural hair than they probably would know, you know, the different styles, the different, you know, intricacies, how to thread it, to style it, just things like that. I wanted to put that. And I wanted people to, I wanted to pass the message of letting people know that they are beautiful regardless, especially with the hair that is growing literally out of their scalp. I spoke to other women with natural hair who tell me, how costly or otherwise it is to have natural hair. Like right now, I'm not doing weaves anymore. Before when I had permed hair, every now and then I'll fix a weave, which you know, like was quite expensive. So probably 200 CDs for like to fix a weave. And then I'll do the weekly salon um, runs and that would cost between 20 and 30 CDs for washing. And if I was doing relaxing, probably 60 CDs. That was like three years ago. But with my natural hair, usually I'll just wash my hair at home and then I'll just like have it in a full puff like for a week. And then every two weeks I would, like the following week I would go to the salon to have it fixed, which is um, for a style like this, it's 65 CDs. I decided to go natural because of the pain and the hurt of the texturizers. And a lot of heat, I, it wasn't helping me. That is why I went natural. Natural hair is easy to go. Even without styling, you can move around with it. Just a little bit of water, easy to comb, and then you move around. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. On the 7th of December, you will be going to the polls to elect a member of parliament. How well do you know your constituency? We take a visit to the Awutu Senya East constituency of the central region. We are coming to you from the Ishaya Soul constituency in the Ashanti region. I'm still in the Aswase constituency. Political parties will be campaigning for your vote. We have got almost about 80 to 90 different projects across the country. There is no single school under any electoral area that has not seen the development of Honorable Muntaka. But as a constituent, what will inform your choice of a candidate to represent you in parliament? My party is my community. What program are you bringing in to solve the problem of my community? It's not to unify a pa. And chance in your answer yet. Nam Neda, Yanta. Are you about the only one? You are going to see other. Yes, we'll be the one when you are in the community. Be involved in what concerns you. My name is Premier Dunyame. Join me on the constituency for all you need to know concerning your social economic development. The constituency airs on City TV Mondays to Thursdays at 5.30 p.m. 
Wearing the right kind of footwear makes a lot of difference in how you come across from making you look classy, trendy, funky and the likes. You can never get it wrong when it comes to your footwear. Can you imagine wearing a three-piece suit in a pair of bathroom slippers or better still, wrapped up in a kente cloth wearing a pair of boots? So that looks very odd, doesn't it? But well, still on footwear, we know that shoes and slippers are all made from various materials from leather to rubber and cloth and the likes. But would you wear a footwear made from trash? The use of recycled products is still fresh waters for a lot of Ghanaians. No, because um, as compared to products used by trash, I don't think it will be that quality to wear. Due to works of social innovators like Makafu Yowuku, many Ghanaians are beginning to see the importance of using recycled products. I will, I will choose um, sandals made from trash because um, it's made in Ghana and then we have to promote what's made in our country. I think I prefer the rubber made one because like, I mean, reprocessing a ways to make a good use of it, I mean, be, uh, coming up with a whole new product is, is a good idea. I, I mean, the whole recycling process is a whole good idea. And this time, it's not only just recycling. You are recycling and bringing it out with the product too. I think it's good. I prefer it to leather because, like, we've been wearing leather all our lives and this is a new innovation. And it's good. Change is good. With a population of nearly 2.9 million, Accra is a rapidly growing capital, producing nearly 2,000 metric tons of waste each day, of which only an estimated 60% is collected. As a result, uncollected plastics obstruct the drainage systems, are burnt illegally, or end up in streams in the ocean. But in a small lab in Adenta, a suburb of Accra, Makafui Awuku and his team at Macintosh Africa have found a solution to the country's waste problems. According to them, this solution has the potential to transform Ghana's footwear industry. We, we go around town to buy the plastic waste from communities and from waste pickers. Or we pick it ourselves because we have volunteer groups. Uh, so we buy the waste from people and then we send the waste to uh, the recycling hub of Ghana. It's at uh, Cable and Wireless in Dakuma. That's where like all the heavy recycling work is happening in the country, but a lot of people don't even know about it. So we send the waste there, the waste is crushed into small pieces, then it's transported back to a facility here in Adenta where it is sanitized uh, with raw bean alcohol, then it is dried, then it is turned into a leather-like material through a process that I innovated over the last eight months. Uh, then this material becomes the raw material for the production of the sandals and then also the production of the bags that we make. So the material goes to the shoemaker, uh, the, the soles are sourced uh, from Makola or from Kumase, the shoemaker finishes the production, it comes back to a facility for labeling, packing and then goes to our shop. Though recycling requires resources and other things to keep it running, how viable is it for Macintosh Africa? So recycling is not that cheap. I mean, sometimes people, the way people talk to me, they feel like because the, the products are from waste, so it has to be cheaper than similar products on the market. But then the waste management value chain, the, the, the chain is a very complicated one, which means that the profit margins are very small. And... Uh, if you, if you don't have the courage, you cannot work in this space. And to even think about creating something that can bring in profit and create jobs is a very daunting task. But one thing for me as a social innovator, as somebody who does a lot of research and experiments, is that I believe that if we keep pushing the limits, we can find ways of beating down the cost, creating innovations that are durable enough and solving the problem in the long term. Although Macintosh Africa is looking to produce over 5,000 pairs of these sandals in the next 12 months and recover over 7 tons of plastic waste through the project, he outlines some of the challenges he faces. One of the biggest challenges of the waste sector is the sourcing of the waste. Uh, even though there's a lot of waste in the environment of Ghana, when it comes to Assessing it as a raw material for production is very difficult. Either they come very contaminated, the cost of acquiring it is expensive, and uh, the cost of treating it to get it to the quality you want is also high. Then there's a bigger cost of moving the waste around. 
somebody can call me in Nungua, they have ways they want to even just give away for free. And then it's just uh, one or two black bags, which is just about three Ghana cities, but it will cost me like 40 cities to transport it from Nungua to Adenta. So you ask yourself, this is not profitable. Why would I want to do this? So uh, the sourcing is a, it's a challenge. Then also uh, funding is a, it's a big challenge. Uh, finding funds to invest in business in a part of the world for some funny reason is a bit difficult. Uh, you have to be very creative. You have to look, I mean, globally to be able to get the support you need. Uh, then also um, the challenge of being able to assess the enabling environment to be able to push the, the, the business and the project to work. The waste sector is not very developed on the sustainability side. It's more of the traditional waste management where they collect the waste and go and dump it on some landfill sites. So for those of us who are innovating the future from waste, it's like we have to push to get everything sorted out because there are a lot of things that are not there. Then also there's the taxing aspect of it. Uh, who we are expecting that for those of us in this space where we are helping solve a big social problem, there should be some tax waivers, there should be some funding opportunities from government. For Mr. Wuku, until the challenges are addressed by authorities, the dream of effectively handling plastic waste will remain a mirage. The number of lives that Gary has saved in this country, you have no idea. Especially in the secondary schools, Gary in a student's chore box can be used to make eba. It can make Gary photo on a rainy day. It's been several years since I left senior high school, but I still enjoy my Gary, especially on a hot afternoon. It can be such a refreshing meal. But for us to continue getting some of this very good Gary to eat, that means that help has to go to the Gary makers at the West Gonja district. Damango. The capital of the Savannah region is noted for the production of quality gari. Many women in the West Gonja municipality are either gari processors, retailers, or both. Although women in these organized groups have basic equipment, many others dotted across the municipality do not have. Yusuf Zulfawu has been selling gari for the past eight years in Damango. Just because they are nice mm. and the surface of it, it looks nice. The way we do it, we always leave it, remove the chaff and everything, any particle out of it. Mm. So that if you see it, it you just admire it, even if you don't want to. But the neatness and how the surface looks like, you admire it and just buy The Kanyitiwale Women's Group operates the biggest gari processing center in Damango. Brahma Masharatu's mother is the leader at Kanyitiwale. She explains how the women here process their gari. And the first thing that we do in Kenitwale Gai Processing Group when the cassava arrives from the farm is to uh, start with peeling. And that is what the ladies are actually doing over there. We peel it, then we have running water here, which we use to wash it because we produce quality gai here and neat ones. That's why we wash it after peeling it. Then we take it to the grinding mill, which we cash it there and grind it. We bring it out for fermentation. Fermentation depends on the type of cassava that you are using, but the maximum it can take is four days. And after fermentation, we take it to the presser. The water in the cassava cannot be drained at the fermentation stage, so we need the help of the presser to drain the water inside the guy so that it will be ready for frying. You can't fry it when it's so wet. So we use the presser to drain the water from it to make it a little bit dry for frying and we have a small steak that we do before we fry the guy and that is sieving it the grinding milk cannot grind it smoothly we still have a little bit chaff left in it so we sieve it to remove the chaff and from that stage it's ready for frying then we fry it and package it for selling though Kaintiwale has some level of equipment they are not without challenges of the season Demand is always less and supply is high. So if we can get uh, help with those that we sell the gai to. As I said earlier, the ladies here are many and some of them take care of the schooling of their children. So if we have uh, people we can supply it to them to boost their confidence and they can produce more and earn more out of it. Municipal Chief Executive for West Gonja, Said Muhazu Jibril says, 
the assembly recognizes the potential of the cassava and gari industry in the municipality and has been linking the women to ready market. Every woman here in Damango belong to a, a group. And I have to commend uh, NGOs for doing that because they have seen the potential in gari production here in the West Gwenja municipality. And so they have come, so many NGOs have come to form women groups scattered across the country, uh, sorry, across the municipality. And so as we speak, we have no less than 17 gari processing groups predominantly women are involved. Well, that'll be all for this edition of the Business Weekly here on City TV. Now, this week we brought you stories about entrepreneurs and how they are processing and packaging uh, local foods. We also brought you stories on how uh, the various prices of products on the market like tomatoes are and also story from the uh, plans to establish a Kinte Museum in Bunri. Next week we'll do all to bring you more on the latest in the world of business. Don't forget to turn to our website citybusinessnews.com for all the latest in the world of business and to know what's happening in television also please tune on to the business dashboard on City TV at 7 p.m. sharp every weekday. My name is Michael Obudu. Thank you for watching. Tune in same time next week. And as always, please stay informed.